They come from the bowels of hell. It's the Dana Gould Hour. Jungle worms and swamp rats run around your feet. I bought a dog that killed the calf that ate the canary. What is true? And once again, welcome back. Hello, all. It's almost summer. I've got my shots. We bought a new tiki for the backyard. And all is as it should be. High atop the Mulholland Drive view shelf here at Falcon's Lair Recording Studios in sunny Southern California. My guest today is Wayne Fetterman. Wayne is a very funny comedian and actor and now author. He has written a book called The History of Stand-Up from Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle. It is a terrific read. I zoomed through it. Now, if you recall, last year we had Cliff Nesteroff on to talk about his book, The Comedians. Wayne's book, the history of stand-up from Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle serves as a perfect companion piece to Cliff's. Whereas Cliff's book dwells on the lives of the comedians he discusses, Wayne gives you an overview, a history of stand-up as an art form in the ways that it grew and changed and evolved. As the title says, it takes you from Mark Twain to Dave Chappelle. And Wayne is here to talk about it. As for me, well... If you're in the L.A. area, live performing is starting to come back. I've been going to the improv regularly, trying to get my sea legs back. So if you want to see me perform, you can try there. Uh, if you're not around L.A., I am as close as YouTube, where you can still enjoy season one of Hanging with Dr. Z, the only talk show on the Internet where evolution moved backward. Hanging with Dr. Z. If you don't know what it is, check it out. You're in for a pleasant surprise. And lastly, if you like the show, please sign up for our Patreon. Five bucks a month gets you the title Dana Gould Hour Sky Cadet with extra audio, video, and some bonus baloney. And the Patreon is how we can afford to keep the show going. This show is a combined effort of people who work very hard every month to create a quality product. And it is the Patreon that allows us to do it. Just five bucks a month. We don't have graded levels. It's not like for $7 a month, I'll come to your house and make you a sandwich. For $10, bucks, i will clean your gutters. Nope. 5 bucks a month. Sign up. Get some stuff. Courtesy of the Dana Gould Hour podcast. Speaking of which, let us now get on to our filthy business. Gould Hour, free and worth it. My guest today, a, a lovely, a lovely man, a good friend, a dear friend, an old friend, but he's not old, but we've known each other a long time, uh, a really, really funny comic and a incredibly underrated uh, comedic actor and has a new book that is nothing less than the history of standup. And it is called the history of standup. And you know, when you, when you, when you do an interview with somebody who's written a book, you got to read the book, but normally it's a book. So you're like, oh, let me skim through this. So I, I know five questions to ask and they'll get me through the interview. I picked it up. I started and I just read it. It was under two hours. I just devoured it. It's 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 uh, tons of information, but in a very accessible read. Uh, highly highly recommended if you're a if you're a comedy fan and uh, you no doubt out or you're not listening to this podcast. Um, please welcome Wayne Fetterman. And this is the sound of my voice. Now, Wayne, how did you how did you come to write this book? And I want to ask you this because you reference. The comedians, yes. by by Cliff Nesteroff. 
What I found interesting about this, having read Cliff's book, is that this book, it they don't overlap. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how you did that. <laughs> but they're they they well, I'll tell you why, because they complement each other great. I love it. I love that's all right. Anyway, you're one of the first to read it. So I'm just taking this all in. Right. Uh the reason is Cliff's book is called The Comedians, and it's incredible book. I yeah. love it. You're in it. It's just that's that's, that's how you know it's good. <laughs> It's right, right. That's I'm all. in it accusing someone of being a coke dealer. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, that's right. right. Uh, or, so. or actually remembering that someone was a coke <laughs> right. dealer. Vividly remembering the facts <laughs> yeah. of my career. Yeah. So his is what <laughs> Cl- Cliff is all like, there's a lot of original interviews in it. He is an out of this world researcher, yeah. especially for those those comedians from the nightclub era that everyone sort of forgot about. He loves those guys and tracked them down. And a lot of them were, were still alive. Yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing. He's the, uh, Ken Burns of, of whatever yeah. subject he so, tackles. But so his book is more about, so he'll take those stories and dive in on a specific story. It's about the comedians. It's about these people. Mm-hmm. My book is the history of stand up, which a lot of it is, what were you doing? What is this thing called vaudeville? What is right. burlesque? Why did nightclubs exist? Why was that different? How did it, the new wave co- start? It, yeah, and it really does cover chapters of yeah. the evolution of an art form. And what I always say is that, that that three of my favorite things are purely American art forms. Can I guess them? Stand-up comedy. Jazz. Trick- and then uh, trick-or-treating. Slow- <laughs> candy they're giving away candy i don't care about the candy it's the concept of trick-or-treat <laughs> love it love it you know so uh, i i remember friends were visiting from england they were here on halloween we took their kids trick-or-treating yeah. which they'd never they have guy fox day but and it's i think they kind of have it now but they didn't at the time and their kids heads exploded <laughs> like they would go up and think, I go, you put them in costume and get them costumes. You go up there, you say trick or treat, and they would go, I've got a sweet, I've got a sweet. Like they were just like, they were just mind their minds. And they come over like, this a pillowcase full of candy. Like they've never seen so much candy before. I was like, yeah, it's America. We do everything big. We, we do we do great stuff big <laughs> and the horrible stuff big. The horrible stuff is bigger than anybody's horrible stuff. <laughs> you know, trail of tears. We don't do things by half measures here in America. It's, it's awful. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but yeah, stand up comedy, certainly. Um, and yeah, you do break it down and I can see as somebody like I can gauge where I come into it. Um, yes, that's the Dana. Can I just, I, I keep interrupting. My whole goal of this book is that it's all one thing. It's been, it's started years ago. It's going to continue after us in many different yeah. ways. And you get on this merry-go-round for a while, and you get to be famous or funny, and you get to be popular, and if you're good at it, and <laughs> yeah. and but most important, you get to make people laugh, like whatever that is. You're right. doing it. Ed Wynn is doing it. It's the same thing, right? Yeah, it it's uh, it, it's it's so true. And you start the book. This is an. It, let's go right to the beginning. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay. Okay. You uh, you attribute it to four founding fathers, Correct. and I and I had always attributed to one of them. So n- won't take the whole time on this, but I do want it, it, to. It's uh, tell me about the four founding fathers of stand up comedy. What people perceive of as stand up comedy in America. Well, there's the they are in order of birth: Artemis Ward, Mark Twain. Uh, Burt Williams and Will Rogers. It's right. those four gentlemen. And, and I'm guessing you're you think Will Rogers was the start of it. I no, I always assume Mark Twain was the start of it. Oh, I always well assume that Mark, uh, his one man shows mm-hmm. were a version of stand up comedy. And I've often attributed that one great story that is told about Mark Twain, where you never really know if you're bombing. Uh, he performed at a show. And it was somewhere in the Midwest. And couldn't get a laugh. You know this story. No, tell uh, me. Oh, he couldn't get a laugh. 
He couldn't, and, he, and it was intermission I'm just, or whatever. I'm just a stand-up historian. I would not know this story. Go ahead, tell <laughs> well, me. Well, he, and he was, he was like, what the hell's going on? This stuff kills. You know, it's like, this. I know this yeah. set. This set kills. But it was like farmers from Nebraska or wherever the hell he was. And he goes out into the, uh, by the lobby, and he's listening to people in the lobby, and he heard somebody say, it's maybe apocryphal, but he said, uh, that was pretty good, huh? Yeah, it's all I could do to keep from laughing. <laughs> Exactly. People thought it would be rude yes. if they laughed, so they were just trying to listen politely. Of course, and I think he went on saying, "No, you're Plus. here to laugh." Yeah, and and uh, and and Will Rogers is actually mentioned uh, a lot in and Cliff Nastroff's new book about yes, yeah, uh, Native American comedians. Uh, yes, we had a indeed. little real estate problem. Um, so, who was Artemis Ward? Real name Charlie Brown, which is fantastic. Yep. <laughs> uh, who's uh, who's Artemis Ward? Artemis Ward. I'm exactly like you, Dana. I thought. Oh, Mark you don't want to be that. <laughs> yeah, no. I'm sorry. Take that back. <laughs> Excuse me, hold on. Where's the medication? Where's the medication? So, uh, I was. I yeah. I thought Mark Twain was like did these funny lectures. Everyone knows he toured the world. He did all these. Apparently, there was a guy before Mark Twain who actually inspired Mark Twain to go like, oh. I'm like a kind of a funny after speaker, after dinner speaker. I could monetize this. And, and that guy's name is Artemis Ward. And he used to do this lecture. And again, this is the time when lectures were a big part of Americana. Right. Like that was called the Lyceum movement. Right. And he Based, was okay. already famous for being writing funny stuff in the newspaper. He was already a funny newspaper columnist, misspelled words. That was kind of his thing. Okay. okay. He was the Norm Crosby of his day. <laughs> right. So he's uh so he starts doing these lectures and right out of the gate, they're huge. They are huge. And if I may take a moment, I had not heard of this guy until, and I talk about it in the book, till Rich Scheidner told me about him. So I was like, well, all right, let me let me see what this guy's all about. So Rich is he's written books about his yeah. own career. He's yeah. uh, he collected stories. He's just great. He's into it as well. So, yeah, so there's a it, bunch yeah. of us. There's a bunch of us. So he uh, told me about, and I did some research, and sure enough, early on, not only does Twain see uh, Artemis Ward lecture in Nevada when he was a newspaper out, guy out there in Nevada, but like was mesmerized by what. This guy, Artemis Ward, did on stage and wrote about it in this book called How to Tell a Story. And apparently, even though they only hung out that couple of weeks, they were friends. And then Artemis Ward, like, helped him when he went to New York. And then so, obviously, I don't know if you know this, but Twain lost a lot of money on a startup. I didn't but, know that. Yes. <laughs> yes, amazing. he did. <laughs> He, because uh, he was publishing these books and felt like he was getting ripped off by the publishers. We know that story, right? Sure. So he's like, I could do this. So we invested in a new type of printing machine that worked great when it didn't work better than any other printing press when it was working. <laughs> okay. Okay. It was one of those things. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. no. Yeah. So he was crazy in debt. And one of the reasons he toured was to get out of debt. And so, but, and he saw how much Not money. Not the first. <laughs> Not right, the right. last either. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that's, that's the story of, of him. And then he toured and became famous. And to this day, once a year, we give out a Mark Twain prize. Sure. To the person who has like the largest comedic effect on the country. So, and a lot, and Joe, Richard Pryor. Like Joe Piscopo won it this year. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so Richard Pryor was the first uh, recipient of that. Right. So, wow. So, so yeah. And, so there's and, a guy. He and you'll see in my book. He, there's just a paragraph. Where he writes just how much he learned about on stage performance because Artemis Ward was a deadpan comedian. He was like a Stephen mm -hmm. Wright. Right. And like people would laugh and he'd look up like, "What's going on? I don't understand." Right. So he did a lot of that. Never. And it's amazing. Up. And it's the 1800s. And yes, he's yeah, already yeah. figured that out. Like, yeah. he's, but he's already meta. <laughs> you know, it's 1860s, <laughs> and he's already like, I'm going to pretend I'm not being funny. Yeah. And they'll laugh even more, which is... Exactly. exactly. And, people, and people always talk about, again, I'm telling you nothing you don't know. 
uh, <laughs> Stephen Wright. People always think about deadpan comedian Stephen Wright, the the guy that influenced Stephen Wright. Mm-hmm. Jackie Vernon. I love it. Yes. Yeah. Of course. Stephen's very open about that. Um, and that's another theme of my book, and I can't believe I keep talking about it, is that everyone influences other people. So sure. it's this constant. So Twain gets influences influenced by, you know, Artemis. Stephen Wright, Jackie Vernon. Mm-hmm. But sometimes it's it's, you know, obviously Robert Klein. There's like a whole school of comedians that were and people, but yeah, people break through. But I know, like you know, uh, look, I know people that have been influenced by me. I can tell you who I was influenced by. So right. it's the, you know, you you think that you're doing something original, but you just don't know the source of the guy that inspired. Like you don't know who Robert Klein yeah. was was. You don't know who Robert Klein was processing. Of course, uh, when he when he when do he you did find that. that interesting at all? Oh, it's fascinating to me. I also like the music. I love it musically as well. Like I, mm-hmm, like I trees. can, yeah. And just like you can, you know, once you know Carl Perkins, which I'm not a well versed in Carl Perkins, but once mm-hmm. you listen to Carl Perkins, that's right. every Beatles guitar fill until right. 1967. <laughs> you know, it's right. it's just George Harrison is just doing Carl Perkins until 67 when he kind of branches out. And right. nothing wrong with that. That's the way it goes. That's how it works. Um, but yeah, that that stuff is is uh fascinating. One of uh, you know, Elvis Costello would always do a thing when he would when when he had nicked a riff, uh, he would play the song in the middle of the song so you knew where he got it. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was uh he was uh he would always do that. He would you'd listen to a song and then suddenly he would be singing a different song and you realize, oh, that's where he got this. And he was very open about, no, this is how we do this. One um, of the best, one of the best part of stories of that, not stories, but it is Steve Martin. Because Steve Martin was such a unique comedian for his time. You're like, yeah. where did this all come from? And a lot of it is from this dude, Wally Bogue, who used at to Disneyland. Work at, Dis- at Disneyland, yeah. 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 And I don't know. You know, there's footage of Wally Bo's act. They filmed it for like a movie to put on before a Disney movie in the 60s. Wow, and it's really know. good. I didn't it's know really that. entertaining. I, I'm going to I'm going to throw you something and then we'll go. I want to go back to the chronology. But this is okay. this is, you know, who I suspect Robin Williams, Wally Bogue was Dick Sean and the producers. Oh, wow. LSD's onstage persona mm-hmm. is Robin. Right. Watch it. Yeah. I, yeah, I yeah. was like, I hadn't seen it in years. That's incredible. And I was watching like, oh, that's Robin. It's yeah. it's it's uncanny. It's un- if it's not, if it wasn't, it's an uncanny parallel. Um but so um the other thing that, you know, part of the thing that people don't like to talk about is yeah. the importance of minstrel shows. Yes. Um, and even I in the book, I'm like, okay, here we go. I'm like, yeah. very, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's funny. In in 1848, I think, mm-hmm. you know, Frederick Douglass uh, ragged on blackface comedians like yeah, as, yeah, far yeah. Back, as far back as 1848, people knew this was a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> but they did it right. anyway. They did it anyway. Um, and, uh, and I'm sure and, people were saying to Frederick Douglass, like, oh, stop with the cancer culture. Yeah, exactly. All right? Just <laughs> stop with it already. Next thing you know, they're canceling the Magna Carta. Come on. Come right, on, right. Come on. <laughs> right. No, yeah. What's, yeah. What's next? What's next? Yeah. No, I can't read a penny dreadful. What's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. No, it's, 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 fa- it's fascinating. Uh, um, it, it, and it is one of those things where you look at it and you go, yeah. And but it's it's not to get too heavy, but <laughs> in the same way that in the fifties and sixties, a lot of Native Americans were portrayed by Italian and Jewish guys in wigs. You know, there is an element of these people are less than, so it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. Uh, and it takes society along and, and it's such a subconscious thing. I'm sure if you asked Chuck Connors, who played 
an Indian chief in a in a in a famous movie. Like, do you hate Native Americans? Be like, what are you talking about? Of course not. Um, it's just uh, at the time it wasn't even. I don't even think it was thought about. Yeah, I know. And I again, uh, I, I I it's such a kettle of fish that I don't yeah. really want to get into it too much. But it does have to do with like, do you think? Well, you are in the Proud Boys. We should just say that and get that out of the way. <laughs> Of course, of course a, a lot of the proud, a lot I'm of the proud boys are into yeah. uh, the Stooge and Martin and Lewis. Yeah. I'm a prideful fella. It's a different thing, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, no, but it, but it's part of the uh, it's part of the evolution of of this art form, and then it segues into what. Next people... thing you're going to tell me, Mickey Rooney was offensive in. <laughs> and I know. Is this what you're getting at? <laughs> and people forget about that. People are like, oh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. It's this amazing romantic comedy. It's, <laughs> it's a train wreck. <laughs> It is one. She's a, I believe, a prostitute. Um, happy go lucky, the way they right. all are. They're all right. they love I, it. I'll and, go lightly. I think yeah, right. yeah. And then Mickey Rooney is in this crazy from a from a. I mean, it's not even. It breaks the reality of the movie. <laughs> He's not even a convincing. You know, it's not like you know Boris Karloff playing Mister Moto, which you can right. argue against, but he looks convincing. Not so breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I, in a weird, and I know this might get me in trouble, defend Mickey Rooney, is I feel like Blake Edwards never gets any f- blowback for that, and it all falls on Sure, it's all, it's all, it's all on, it's Blake Edwards was the guy that's directing him, and Blake yeah, Edwards is sure the guy bigger. Make it I'm big. sure. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, it's never anybody who's been in the movie will tell you it's not your performance that's on screen. It's the director's performance. Yeah. Yeah. That was Thank this you. famous story about George C. Scott, and oh. George C. Scott did not like Doctor Strangelove. He famously said, that is not my performance. That is not the performance I wanted to give. But Stanley Kubrick just kept pushing him and pushing him and pushing him and always printing the last tape. Thank God. Thank God. And and George C. Scott wouldn't, at first, the reason that George C. Scott even took his direction was because he fancied himself a chess master, and Stanley Kubrick was like, "Oh, we should play chess." <laughs> and Stanley oh. like took him to the cleaners. Right. And he was like, All right, well, this guy clearly, <laughs> this guy clearly knows what he's doing on the chessboard. Um, but vaudeville and burlesque is really what people think of. I think if the average person goes, "Where did stand up start?" You think of vaudeville. It's so. Can I just blow push back on that a little bit? Like when I talk to people, other people are like, "Oh, it didn't start till George Garland." Other people yeah. are like, "Oh, it didn't start <laughs> till." Um, Mort yeah. Saul. Whoever I saw growing up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, or just, yeah. Gary like, Mule, Gary Mule here. Didn't he start it? <laughs> the way you lay your book out, which I really loved, is it is like chapters in a book. There are these four monologists, and then minstrel shows evolved it to this point, and then that evolved because of societal changes into vaudeville and burlesque, and from that we get the Marx Brothers, and from that world, that moved into who you call the first modern stand-up was a guy named Frank Fay, right? And th- yeah, I'm who not I'd never heard of, it. who I'd never heard of. Oh wow! Well, it don't <laughs> Frank Fay is a fascinating guy because. That's Bob Hope's guy. That is his, like whenever he would be interviewed, like who do you see? He was like, I saw this guy do Frank Fay. I was like, oh, you can be that on stage, as opposed to oh, I'm an Irish guy or I'm a you know a Hebrew thing and a character German, and so that really caught him. But the weird thing about Fay and and Cliff goes into it in his book is that he was like sort of a very I don't know German. He was very sympathetic to the Nazi cause, is the way I would say it. And he was hated and he was just hated. So he's like a really interesting guy just as a character in this whole story was this dude who starts emceeing at the palace. And people are like, oh, my God, this is possible. And yeah. So, yes, Frank Fay is. And he was basically, well, if Hope was influenced by him, he was just basically a joke teller. Just like punchline, punchline, punchline or. Yeah. And I mean, he did his famous thing was he did a like there was a T, the song T for two. He would break it down like T for two and two for T. How many ways can we say it? You know, and then in between. So, yeah, like he had a bit, had a like a bit. He did have a bit. He did have a closer. But apparently he was like a super fast ad libber and would make fun of the acts when they got off the stage. And so MCing 
was like a really way to showcase this new kind of comedian who, guess what? I'm in a sharp suit. I'm in a tie. Right. I'm not he, in a, he wasn't like a famous baggy pants vaudevillian. Well, even think make, of the Marx Brothers. Yeah. You never see them looking like a sharp upper class person. No, they were They're, cartoon characters. Yeah, yeah. Running around causing. So, yes. So that, so that definitely Frank Fay is uh, the start of that kind of comedian. So if you think of Richard Belzer or something or, you know, just a guy like a smart guy on stage who's faster than everyone in the room. Wow. Wow. And, yeah. that, and, 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 and Bob Hope saw him. Yes. And, and, and took it to, and whatever happened. Bob Hope what, was a song and dance guy. And Bob did Hope world. Was, did, oh, right. Yeah. He was like, a, and yeah. you can see that in his many, many wonderful, <laughs> timeless musical numbers. <laughs> like the one that Gilbert always shows the Jack Frost. Oh, right. uh, have you ever seen it? It's uh, Gil, I just did Gilbert's podcast, and he's right. obsessed with this. It's Bob and Dolores. It's a sketch right. they both oh, no. did about okay. Bob plays Jack. Bob plays Jack Frost. Yeah, YouTube it. It's a fever dream. It's <laughs> it is a fever dream. It Love is um, it is uh, it is mind boggling. And it was <laughs> while we were both alive. And it was on national television. Of course, of course. You know, you see those things and you go, how, how was this on TV? (laughs) It's like, people loved it. Um, But I also wanted to talk about, because you talk about Elsie Janis. Yes. Thank you for paying attention to my book. (laughs) Yeah, I read the book. I told you. (laughs) Um, uh, And, and, uh, and Elsie Janis uh, was the first, what well, you're to maybe the first modern day stand up comedian. I don't even know if that's a proper no, term no, anymore. I, that's not, that's not the point I'm making. Cause she was a variety. She did it. She did singing. Right. She told, but she was known for impressions, right? She could do like mainly guys. She would do Will Rogers. She would do, uh, George M. Cohen. So she was really known for that. And that's how she became a vaudeville headliner. There was a few of these, but she could. She would also sing and interact and right. do sing alongs. She and she wanted to be an actress too. So she wasn't straight stand up. Right. But what's interesting about her is she was the first one to entertain the troops overseas. Oh, uh, before Bob Hope. T- twenty years before. Right. Bob. Yeah. Twenty yeah. years before, before there was ever a thing called the USO. She was in France because she was doing a play over in England, and then went to the front lines. And she's yeah, and just would stand on the back of a truck with the guy with the piano and then do jokes and have people sing along and just make the guys feel good. I mean, this is World War One. This is World War One, not World War Two. World War One. Yeah. This yeah. is World War One in France on the front lines. There's mustard gas. There's it's not a you saw nineteen seventeen, right? I did. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there's one guy shooting a nonstop shot of a camera right. with the camera, the whole right. thing. So yeah, she's incredible. Yeah. Wow, I didn't. And well, who do you who do you place as the first traditional what we well, think of as a comedian? Kathy I Griffin. I think I. <laughs> it's uh, I don't know if you've heard of Nikki Glaser, but she's <laughs> incredible. <laughs> the I would I think it's either Moms Mabley because Moms Mabley also started out doing music and dancing. And then kind of segged into this character, yeah. So right. So so, but Mom said it was still a character. She was young and playing an old woman, and that was a character. So was, I would say Mom's Mabley, and then this comedian Jean Carroll, who who were yeah. Jean Carroll is the one that I you do heard about. Okay, yeah, yeah. So I would say those two seem to be. But don't forget, there was like women doing one woman shows, like Nan Halperin and stuff, right? Just or Ruth Draper, and they would do like character, like a Lily. They would be like a Lily Tomlin type comedian, right? So who do you? But talk about like Jean Carroll. What 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 was uh, her era, and what did she do? This is 1945. Her husband went off to World War. She used to be part of a comedy team with her husband, and then. She he went off to World War II and she's here and she's like, ah, may, I'm gonna try being a single. And there's a lot of comedians in this era. This is the Jackie era, let's call it that. There's a lot of guys whose name are Jackie or Joey, mm-hmm. Jackie, you know, it was that. And then she uh 
She went on stage, not as a character, as herself, woman, career woman, and just did one-liners. And she was phenomenal at it. There's a lot of footage of her. Um, and this is early, early 50s. Or she started in the late 40s, immediately became huge. Like immediately. And just great jokes all the way through. Right. And then his, here's the crazy part about it. Like in the 60s, she made it all the way into the 60s. Just stops to give it up to be a housewife. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And and are there any modern comedians that comedians like did Phyllis Diller say, well, I'm just doing Gene Carroll or um, the biggest is I spoke about her just a second ago was Lily Tomlin. Lily uh-huh. Tomlin was mesmerized whenever she saw like who, what what's going on? I'm used to seeing Jackie Mason and Jan Murray and Alan King on uh, Ed Sullivan. There's a woman that can do this. This is incredible. So she's to this day talks about what an influence she was. Wow. And and talk a little about Moms Mabley, because she's, again, you talk about somebody that was so important, so ahead of their time, yeah. especially when you look at where we were as a culture at the time that she was breaking down boundaries. It's truly uh, 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 alarming what she <laughs> accomplished. Yeah. Well, she was just this hilarious woman who did this. She would, like, dance and, and do this little... A song at the end of her act. And, and this is also we, late 40s, early 50s? This is, yeah, no, she started earlier. She's from the 20s. She's, right. She was older. I, and then, But she was, unfortunately, at this time, this, it was like two show businesses. There's sort yeah. of white show business. Sure. And there's not white, black show business. Right. And there were a few people that were able to cross over and be in white show business. Like Buck and Bubbles was a famous team that was like, they could play vaudeville, and obviously, they were you know, uh, they were black. They were black. Right, yes, yeah. yeah. Is and this the Chitlin Circuit? Yeah. So she, before even the Chitlin Circuit, there was something. There was another vaudeville circuit called Toba, uh, and so she played there. She got discovered by this incredible comedy team called Butter Beans and Susie. Have you ever heard of them? No. Great. Classic old time, old timey. There's records of them, like they still exist. So anyway, so Butterbeans and Susie saw her, saw her potential, and then took her under the wing. And then she just created an act, and then developed. And then over the years, she came up with this character of Mom's, which was lady in an old like uh, house dress, s- slippers, hat, and was a man crazy older woman. Like that was her. Thing. And it was a complete fabrication. It was just. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I think she was. I think she's a lesbian. Like that's if I'm not mistaken. And so she started doing this in on the Chitlin circuit, which included a theater called the Apollo was like the that was the height of the Chitlin circuit. The one in New York it. or a different. No, the one in New York. Yeah. So. So and then she just, uh, you know, and then when. What happened was when Dick Gregory broke the color line and started playing white nightclubs, suddenly television starts going, oh, let's bring in Red Fox. Let's bring in that. And this mom's maybe she's now in her 60s, probably starts doing like um, the Smothers Brothers show and then starts selling albums like crazy. Really? Like in the early 60s. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She is like a million. Yeah. It's like a phenom and now she's playing all over she plays colleges she's uh so th- through the end of her career she's like this stand-up icon yeah but unfortunately she was- until 1960 she really was siloed in a very specific i can only play these rooms right and whoopi goldberg first got on the map for doing a one-woman show about mom's maybe of course yeah of course yeah Which people don't uh people don't um people don't put together <laughs> Um, and well, then you, you, like I said, Whoopi did a documentary about her. This in, incredible on HBO. I'm always amazed by what the, 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 the women during the, like you have these men that are breaking through these barriers and, and redefining an era mm-hmm. and, uh, there are all there are 
there were women doing it at the same time, but as they say, like with Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, they're doing it backwards in high heels. You know, they always have the, they are the ones that are, in addition to breaking through this whole thing, they're, they're also breaking through the gender boundaries. And, uh, the, the one that you talk about in the book that again, is somebody that I've known about take for granted. You don't really appreciate what they did, what they accomplished Mm -hmm. was mini Pearl. Right. Right. And Minnie Pearl is very similar to Mom's Mabley in that she's sort of siloed in this country western. Corn pone. Yeah, 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 that world. And that still exists today, by the way. There's right. a bunch of comedians that play that circuit. There's an incredible comedian named Chandra Pierce. I don't know if you know her. She headlines churches. That's what she does. She plays those, you've seen those huge. Is she like a Christian comedian? Yeah, she's a Christian comedian, but it's not all about being Christian, you know, Mm -hmm. and she's incredible. But I feel like Hollywood and New York always thinks of that as like, oh, this is some hee-haw stuff that we're not really interested. They're getting laughs the same as uh, John Mulaney's getting laughs. Sure. Well, I think that the the blue-collar comedy tour— in the, right, that was part of it. Yes, that's right, the crossover that, of it. Yeah, that really showed people like, no, 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 no. There's a lot of people out here <laughs> that, that want a voice. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah. again, it's. I think it kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier, and I'm just pushing this out, that there's sort of an other thing like, oh, the, those crackers or thing. Yeah, or redneck. sure. So it's like you already feel like maybe superior to them or something like well, that. Well, you know, the, and and— you know, that has been a, you know, the interesting thing is it's been a constant in our culture Uh huh. F- from, from the time of Twain, you know, it's, it, it's not new. Right. And, you know, during the late sixties, early seventies, when I was a little kid, uh, you know, watching my mom was from Virginia. So even though I grew up in Massachusetts, she watched Hee Haw. Mm-hmm. And we would watch Hee Haw and they had junior samples and, and, you know, all those sort of Southern fried mini, that's how I know who mini Pearl is. And it, it was like, you know what they do up North? You know, it was very <laughs> much, uh, I, Andy, the Andy Griffith show was maybe the crossover of that attitude. It was like, you know, the, right. the people down, simple folks down South are much smarter. Then, oh, you know, so you think it was have, the opposite? We have com- no, no. I think he was saying the same thing, but it was a crossover. That the the whole point of that attitude is we're simple folk. We're Small not fancy, town. But, right? Yeah. And then at the end of the day, we're smarter because we have common sense. And right, right, the, right, right. As Mel Brooks would say, "We're the common clay. <laughs> we're the common clay." And <laughs> and that was the undercurrent of of that sense of humor, right? That that that. N- 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 Nixon weaponized as the silent majority. Wow. Interesting. You know, it was, it wasn't until it was this, that was the Southern strategy. That was the silent majority. Like we, the simple American people, the, the, the non-elites. Right. Are smarter. Backbone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Look at me. There's grain in the background. Yeah, exactly. And that was the, that was the, the, the comedic voice of it. The, 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 the voice that we, I think, and, and most modern stand-ups um, claim a kinship to, and the era of stand-up that I get the most excited about is late 40s, early 50s, World War II is over, everybody comes back from the war, mm-hmm. people start having babies, moving into the suburbs, but in the a lot cities, of money. A, lot of money. a lot of money, but in the cities... Nightclubs go, nightclubs explode, dinner theater and nightclubs explode, yeah. and a whole new breed of comedian comes to the fore to satisfy this need. And that's where all of, that's where modern stand-up really calcified with Mort Saul and Shelley Berman and Lenny Bruce. What what we imagine as a modern-day stand-up comedian found its footing, and, uh, and, it, and it's... The, you know, if if you look at stand up as an evolutionary ladder, this is the first upright. <laughs> you know, the, right. This is the first upright anthropoid. Right, and I don't know if I totally agree with that because I do feel like there. This was- interview is over. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we've lost. We've lost the signal. <laughs> yeah, I, I. Yes, I mean a lot of people have made that point, but in a way, you're combining two different eras. Mm-hmm. You're combining 
the nightclub era, which is Ciro's and the Copacabana and the Latin Quarter and all of that, with this sort of alternative, which was I'm calling the new wave in my book, which is Mort Saul at the Hungry Eye. And then uh, Shelly Berman in a little club right. in, in Chicago called Mr. Kelly's. Right. Like, these aren't like the big fancy they're opening night- for ja- They're opening for jazz bands, basically. Right. Jazz bands, folk singers. And so, so it's like right. sort of, the, and there was a big divide between what Joey Bishop was doing and what those guys were doing. And Joey Bishop was definitely a World War II, you know, part of that. Right. You know, I'm in a tux, I'm performing in a tuxedo. Right. And I'm here. So there's there's a slight difference. Well, it, it, it is, but it's also... Very much right. in the same way But to that were, end, they're, they're heads and tails. Oh, okay. But in the yeah. same way that you, and I write about it in the book, and Janine, when you started doing what became known as alt mm-hmm. comedy, was a reaction against the 80s comedians with their, yeah. not tuxedos, skinny ties. Skinny ties and their, and their suit jacket sleeves pushed up around their elbows. Right, so you were part of this. So you've seen this kind of thing where there's this right, but, but like, to the, but to that end, yeah, they coexist at the same time. Of course, you know, they're, of course, they're, yeah. yeah, they're yin and Buddy yin, Hackett yin and yin. is around at the same time that Mort yeah. Saul and Shelley Berman and Bob Newhart are around. Right, yeah, and yeah. and and, and, and so- in a way, I know they're not a stand-up comedy, but Nichols and May I think are very important in this. In like, oh, they they were doing records and definitely, yeah. I'm not going to use the word elitist, but let's say. Uh, well, they're on Broadway, and they were, yeah, you know, yeah, they were, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but exactly. it is, but it is, it is inter- it is interesting, in that, um, people attribute like Lenny Bruce, he's an easy shorthand for the modern day acerbic, mm-hmm. boundary breaking comedian. and also social critic. Right, that's what he's I mean. the one. Like, critic. oh, you think America is great? Guess what? Right. You're it's hypocrites. Not. Right. There's 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 10 Puerto Ricans living in this house as I'm walking to this church, which is incredible. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. But, but Mort Saul kind of beat Lenny to the punch, did he not? Yes, he did. Yes, yeah. he did. No question, no question. Tell, but, tell, tell a little bit about Mort Saul. Because, well, it's funny because they were both working here in Los Angeles at the same club. There was a club called the Crescendo on mm-hmm. Sunset Boulevard. And above it is a room called the Interlude, and they would do shows. The Interlude was the smaller. I believe the- Allison Martino just posted a picture of the Interlude. Really? Yeah. So, so anyway, yes, Mort Saul was, you know, again, so I, I don't. I'm trying to make it as fast as possible. No, it's fine. It's good. He, like, he comes out of San Francisco, and he is. He's working at a place called The Hungry Eye, which is ki- kind of like sort of your first jazz comedy club. It's in a basement. So anyway, so he's playing this little room, which is different than what's going on at the Sahara Hotel. That's th- what's going on in Vegas. What's go- you know, what's mm-hmm. going on in Miami Beach or even in the Catskills with these big rooms. And he starts doing this. Poli- he does political humor that's in the vein of Will Rogers, but it's a little more pointed and he's attacking president Eisenhower who just, just was elected. This is 1953. And of course the intellectuals and the bohemians in San Francisco, you live there, you know that there's that side to it. So they love him. He starts packing the room. And again, this isn't a showcase comedy club, right? This is just, he's a booking. It's a book. He's making money. And then local writers start writing about him. And he's not in a tuxedo. People like Nat he's in a sweater. What? Nat Hentoff. And- yeah, all of those guys. Uh, I can't think of the other guy who wrote for the... Uh, anyway, so he gets a reputation right out of the gate. It was like, oh, he's doing something different. Tours. And believe it or not, he's the first comedian to sort of work colleges. He would work with uh, Dave Brubeck at colleges and opened up that market. So if you've ever done a gig at a college... Tip of the hat to Mort Saul. They're true tales from Weirdsville. Tales from Weirdsville. And they're true. Can your heart stand 
The Shocking Facts. His name was Ernie Nash, and he was born in Texas in 1896. When he was 12 years old, his family moved to New York City, and Ernie Nash got bit by the acting bug. At the age of 15, Ernie and his friend Moses Horwitz joined a vaudeville troupe called the Annette Kellerman Diving Girls. It didn't work out, as they say, and Ernie and his friend Moses went their separate ways. Undeterred, Ernie developed an act all on his own, changing his name along the way from Ernie Nash to the equally unremarkable Ted Healy. By the 1920s, Ted Healy was one of the highest paid acts in vaudeville, making $9,000 a week in 1920s monies. The show, Ted Healy's Syncopated Toes, was a collection of acrobatic stunts. Healy expanded the show, and he placed an ad in the paper for new performers. One of the applicants was his childhood friend, Moses Horwitz, who by now had changed his name to the less ethnic Mo Howard. Mo passed the audition, but he was no acrobat, so he joined the show as a mark. A mark is a performer planted in the audience who is then called up on stage during the performance. The other members of the audience, not knowing that this guy's a plant, are usually so delighted when this ordinary member of the crowd turns out to be oh so funny. In vaudeville in the 20s, they did not use the term mark, they used the term stooge. In 1924, Moe's brother Shemp joined the act, also as a stooge. Healy's syncopated toes went through a myriad of title and format changes. By 1928, it had morphed into a review called A Night in Spain. In March of 1928, while performing at the Grand Opera House in Chicago, a local actor named Larry Fine joined the cast. In 1930, Healy was hired by Fox Films to make a movie called Soup to Nuts. And he brought several members of his A Night in Spain cast with him, among them Mo Howard, Shemp Howard, and Larry Fine. After Soup to Nuts, Howard Fine and Howard left Healy and toured independently as The Three Lost Souls. After a time, Shemp went off and pursued a solo career, billed for a time as The Ugliest Man in Hollywood, You can see him in Abbott and Costello Join the Navy. Shemp was then replaced by his and Moe's other brother, Jerome, who was renamed Curly. The new lineup of Moe, Larry, and Curly signed a deal with Columbia Pictures to make a series of short movies under the name The Three Stooges. From 1934 to 1946, Moe, Larry, and Curly made over 90, 90 short subjects for Columbia. The 30s and 40s boasted several popular comedy teams, many of them comprised of actual brothers. The Marx Brothers, of course, are legends. Witty and clever, they boasted brilliantly unique characters in the forms of Groucho, Harpo, and Chico, and yes, also Zeppo. The Marx Brothers' on-screen anarchy was and remains without peer. They had help, of course, employing writers like S.J. Perlman, Leo McCary, George S. Kaufman, Herman Mankiewicz, Robert Florey. In addition to the Marx Brothers, the Stooges were also in competition with the Ritz Brothers, comprised of Al, Jimmy, and Harry Ritz. Unlike the Marx Brothers, and the Three Stooges for that matter, the Ritz Brothers didn't really have individual characters. Al, Jimmy, and Harry Ritz, they looked alike, they acted alike, They weren't as witty and clever as the Marx Brothers, nor as fiercely physical and downright brutal as the Three Stooges, but they were funny for their time, and they made a nice living. But the Three Stooges were undeniably unique. They would never say a line when they could hit each other instead, or put each other's heads into a vice, or tear each other's hair out, or jam a claw hammer up each other's noses. You get the picture. And where Groucho Marx had witticisms like, she offered her honor, He honored her offer, and all night long he was honor and offer. Mo Howard had zingers like, Remind me to kill you later. Jerome Howard, Curly, to the world, suffered a stroke in 1946 and left the group allowing Shemp to return until his death 
1955. At the time of Shemp's death, the Stooges still owed Columbia Pictures four shorts, and they hired an actor named Joe Palma and used the old footage of Shemp with Joe with his back to the camera to finish the shorts. People with sharp eyes can easily spot a fake Shemp, however, and the term is often used, if you're cool and know what you're talking about, to describe a stunt double. Check out the credits of Army of Darkness. After the four fake Shemp stooge shorts were completed, Joe Besser replaced Shemp as the third stooge, but only for two years. His wife became ill right around the time Columbia terminated its shorts program. Now, by this time, TV is becoming popular and gaining a foothold in American homes. And like your phone now, it was hungry for product, or as they say now, content, 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 Oh, precious content. So Columbia Pictures formed a TV unit called Screen Gems, and they sold the Three Stooges short subjects to TV. By the early 1960s, thanks to TV, the Three Stooges became huge. They were bigger than they ever were before, and as far as they were concerned, they had retired. But, buoyed by their TV fame, comic actor Joe Dorita became Curly Joe in 1958 for a new series of full-length movies. They made about six in the late 50s uh, up to the uh, mid-60s. The most famous is probably Three Stooges Meet Hercules. Uh, the Stooges kept working. They made cameos on TV. They appeared in uh, It's a Mad, 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 Mad World. And uh, by 1970, still working... They were in the middle of filming a pilot for a Three Stooges TV series when Larry Fine suffered a severe stroke and that effectively ended the act. That said, the Stooges, for all of their lowbrow antics, outlasted all of their contemporaries, the Marx Brothers, the Ritz Brothers, Abbott and Costello, all of them. Amazing story if it ends there, right? Well, nope. The story hasn't even started. Now, do you remember Al Adamson? We covered Al Adamson extensively in the Halloween episode uh, last year. Al Adamson, who, along with his producing partner Sam Sherman, made Satan Sadists, Psycho A Go Go, Blood of Ghastly Horror. The same Al Adamson who was later murdered by his handyman and buried under his own hot tub? Yes, that Al Adamson. Well, if you haven't heard the story of Adamson, you might want to go back and check out last year's Halloween episode. It is a doozy. But for the sake of this story, you're fine. Just know that Al Adamson and his producing partner, Sam Sherman, made a lot of crap, but they were unpretentious guys who knew exactly what they were doing and seemed to have a sense of humor about it. Here is Sam Sherman talking about the movie Dracula vs. Frankenstein. And I used to say, look, we got some good stuff, we got some crap. I said, how much crap? Well, 10, 15, 20 percent. Can we eliminate some of that? And I edited this and edited it for six months and rewrote it and changed it. And it ended up after two or three more levels of reshooting and reconfiguring as Dracula vs. Frankenstein. Well, who could hate that? It was a kooky, crazy film. It had named stars in it. It had sex. It had blood. It had classic characters. And it just went out and played and made money everywhere. Okay. Another thing about Sam Sherman, who's still with us, by the way, bless his heart, he might have made films like Satan Sadists and Blood of Ghastly Horror, but he had a deep love of classic movies. He collected them. He, he's a walking encyclopedia. He started his career as a very young man writing for Wildest Westerns magazine, which was basically the cowboy movie companion to Famous Monsters magazine, same publisher, Warren Publications, and, and Sam interviewed old cowboy stars. This brings us to... 1973's The Naughty Stewardesses. Yes. 
As the 1970s got underway and the biker craze started by Easy Rider started to wane, Sam Sherman decided to crank out a softcore nudie pick to keep the money rolling in. The Naughty Stewardesses is described online thusly. Sexy air stewardesses. Four naughty female flight attendants become involved with a wealthy womanizer with unsurprising results. They live out their wildest sexual softcore nude fantasies. Natch. But because this was Sam Sherman, the movie starred Robert Livingston as the wealthy womanizer. Who is Robert Livingston? Well, Robert Livingston was an old-time Western star from the 20s and 30s. Uh, He'd been in dozens of, of grade B Westerns, what they would call programmers or odors, Uh, He was in the Cisco Kid TV series. He was an old cowboy actor, and he had long retired. But for some reason, he was friends with Sam Sherman. And Sam coaxed poor Robert Livingston out of retirement to be in his titty flick. Way to go, buddy. Sam loved to do this, by the way, which explains why both Lon Chaney Jr. and J. Carol Nash appear in Dracula vs. Frankenstein, even though both look like they were brought back from the dead just to get to the set. Well, what do you know? The naughty stewardesses made money. So Sam set to work on a sequel. And he got the idea for the Jet Set, of course, from an old Abbott and Costello movie <laughs> called Ride 'em Cowboy, which naturally gave Sam the idea to set his horny stewardess sequel in the Old West. Now, before I go any further, I have to cite the source material for this part of the story because I had never come across it before. Um, I knew about the movie that we're talking about, but I did not know this story. And I have to draw your attention to a a really great resource called Anthony Balducci's Journal. Anthony, B-A-L-D-U-C-C-I. Anthony Balducci's Journal. Go to anthonybalducciblogspot.com. anthonybalducci.blogspot.com. And he ran an amazing piece uh, that is the source material for the rest of this story. And I want to thank Anthony for, uh, uh, for writing it. And uh, tip of the hat to Scott Alexander, who sent me this article. So credit where credit is due. Um, Anthony Balducci is how I heard this amazing story. Okay. As Sam Sherman started to get the jet set underway, he had his director, Al Adamson, he had an old cowboy star, Robert Livingston, and he even got Yvonne DiCarlo, Lily Munster herself, to play uh, somebody in the movie. He had his stewardesses all lined up, but something was missing. The film needed some comic relief. So Sam called, who else? Joe Franklin, the old-time showbiz maven and uh, New York City talk show host, who, uh, when Sam called him, according to Anthony Balducci's journal, Joe Franklin responded, as only Joe Franklin can, there's only one man I can think of, Harry Ritz. Here's something you don't get to say that often in a modern podcast. Yes, that Harry Ritz. Of the Ritz brothers. But Sam Sherman couldn't get a hold of Harry Ritz. You don't just pick up the phone and get Harry Ritz. Uh... So now Sam had his back against the wall. He knew that Larry Fine was not well. Uh, The knowledge of Larry's stroke and debilitation was very widespread. I mean, the Stooges were famous. And obviously, most especially amongst fans of old movies. On a whim, Sam... And it's funny because Sam Raimi also did this when he was in college. Sam Sherman called the Screen Actors Guild retirement home and asked for Larry Fine, and got him. Hello? Sam introduced himself and told Larry about the film that he was hoping to make. Uh, Sam Raimi just called and said he was a fan. So after a long wind-up, Sam Sherman asks Larry, Do you think that you and Mo and Joe Dorita would like to be in this movie we're making? And Larry responded the way any trooper does when they're asked to perform. He said, I'm not well. But Sam Sherman 
would not be denied. He told Larry, you don't have to worry. We'll shoot around you. Sam's plan was that Larry would stay seated the entire movie. He envisioned scenes where Moe and Joe bring wheelchair-bound Larry to a health club located at the Dude Ranch that was the setting of the film, The Jet Set. You know, the Dude Ranch Health Club. And Larry would get, quote-unquote, rejuvenated and chase the stewardesses around in a motorized wheelchair, allowing Moe and Joe to do all the heavy lifting, as it were. Sam next called Moe. Moe Howard, formerly Moses Horowitz, and asked if he'd like to be in the movie. Here is something that is not surprising. Moe was not well either, but he was actually more receptive to the idea than Larry. So Moe referred Sam to his agent, who was also his son-in-law, and they struck a deal. Keeping true to his word, Sam rode around Larry, focusing the action on Moe and Curly Joe Dorita. In one scene, Moe plays a hairdresser who loses patience with one of the young women in his chair, so he, according to the script, chloroforms her and shaves her head. Okay. But then, Larry suffered another stroke and sadly passed away. Two weeks later, Sam called the manager of the Three Stooges, now the Two Stooges, and also Moe's son-in-law, Norman Moorer. But Norman assured him that he had a plan. Emil Sitka! Of course! Emil Sitka was a character actor who had starred along with the Stooges in many of their shorts for Columbia Pictures. If you Google Emil Sitka... You go, oh, yeah, I've seen that guy in a million things. Norman said that he could replace Larry. They could call him Harry. I know. It's a terrible idea. Terrible enough to work. Eventually, the jet set went into production, filming in and around Palm Springs, which is about a two and a half hour drive from L.A., four hours if there's traffic. There was on Sunday. Um, on the day the Stooges were to arrive on the location, Sherman called Moe at home to get some mundane details like when his flight was arriving. Moe responded simply, I don't want to fly. Undeterred, Sherman said simply, No problem, we'll have someone drive you. Yeah, I don't want to drive, said Moe. Again, this is all from Anthony Balducci. Well, how do you plan on getting here today? asked Sam. A little nervous, since he was in the middle of making a movie. Mo replied, I can't come today at all. I have a cold. Do you think you can come tomorrow? I don't know. Not what you want to hear. Um, after shooting around the Missing Stooges for a couple of weeks, Sam Sherman and Al Adamson had to shut the film down. Uh, Mo Howard, for his sake, uh, felt horrible, which is why he couldn't do the film, but he also felt horrible about missing shooting because he felt horrible. What Sam didn't know was that Mo Howard was dying of lung cancer, and he did, in May of 1975. Sherman briefly toyed with hiring Joe Besser, but finally and reluctantly admitted that there was no Stooges without Mo. And then, two things happened. Mel Brooks' Blazing Saddles became a hit, and Sam Sherman finally got a hold of Harry Ritz. And that is why the Ritz brothers and not the Three Stooges starred in what became known as Blazing Stewardesses. Look up, look out. Look what happens when three cool big city chicks set the West on fire. Blazing Stewardesses. This is Groucho Marx. Did you know, for example, that your chances of surviving an atom bomb attack are excellent? It's true. I'm convinced that these precautions are necessary right now. They're important to your family, yourself, and your community. Settle back now, content, comfortable, well-fed, and ready for some fine entertainment. Is everybody happy? Then let's go.
It's showtime. So that was the great thing about him. And then he went across the country and 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 became like this Moses of this new way yeah. to do stand up. And and people don't realize how big Mort Saul was. In the late fifties. Yeah. He was on yeah. the cover of Time magazine. So on the cover of Time magazine, I believe I believe Paul Newman was like he was at Paul Newman's wedding or Paul yeah, Newman yeah, was at yeah. his wedding. Like it was a, he was a massive star and and Lenny Bruce had a had a bit about Mort Saul on his, right, on, right, his, right, on, right. Uh, on uh on the live at Carnegie Hall. He 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 does a bit about Mort Saul and Shelley Berman. Yeah. So it's a it's an incredible break. He's like he is a credible break from the way stand ups were or still were in mainstream in mainstream nightclubs. And here's what's great about him. He influences two comedians directly, directly, who never thought about doing stand-up until they saw him doing it in this way, in the same way that Bob Hope didn't think about stand-up until he saw Frank Fay. And those two comedians are Shelley Berman, who was an improv guy, part of the Compass Players. Right, Compass Players. Not Second yes. City. Yes, in, 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 in Chicago. Right. And then... And the other one is Woody Allen, who was a writer in New York. And they went to see him at these little clubs, uh, Mr. Kelly's and the Blue Angel in New York. And we're like, oh, well, I, I could do that. I can't do what Milton Berle's doing where I walk out and it's like I mow people down with, you know, 45 right. minutes of incredible stuff. And then, right. you know, do a bid and then run off the stage or I can't do what Martin and Lewis, Lewis are doing. Yeah, they're they're the people at the time that are just like you would see them and go, well, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I can imagine like somebody like Woody Allen. <laughs> In, in that in that past context, not modern right. day convention, but right. like you know, seeing Martin and Lewis, it'd be like somebody thinking of starting at a band, some someone thinking of starting a band, and and going. So I'll go see the Who in seventy one. You know, <laughs> right, right. Can I do this? <laughs> no, exactly. So <laughs> you know. yeah, so that's what's great about Mort Saul is that he showed a whole world. That's why I call him like a Moses, a whole world, the promised land of like. Oh, you can be smart. You can be self-deprecating. You can do political stuff. You can. You don't have to be slick in any right. way. I don't know if you've listened to Mortzall records. They're kind of. They're very halting and jerky. And yeah, 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 yeah. So and the, the fact that he wore a sweater on stage was a <laughs> huge statement. It was very. Yeah. It was very punk rock. <laughs> for, it's like David Cross he, wearing shorts. Yeah, no, it really is. It, it it really is. It's just like, what are you doing? What are you, it's so funny. Bob I was I was talking to Bobcat Goldthwait. Uh huh. Uh, he was telling me about when he did an episode of Tales from the Crypt with Don Rickles, and oh they became God. friends over the course of the week. Yeah. And you know, Don Don was one of those guys that you know on stage he would shit all over you, or in public, and then in private he was the sweetest guy in the world. He was the opposite of Jerry Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and the only thing about Bobcat that Don couldn't understand was that he wore jeans on stage. Right. Other than that, Bob was like, no, I get it. Yeah, it's great. It's yeah. Just I, I had an actually conversation with Alan King about this very thing when, which was he would be always his, lighthearted Alan King. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But he wouldn't put on his pants. Yeah, same with, right, same with Jerry. Same with Jerry. And wait tell him why. Tell minute. him why. Yeah. You don't want to crease him. Yeah. Forget yeah. about jeans. You don't want, like, at your knees, a little yeah. line there. Yeah. How crazy saw, is that? Just I saw Alan King on the Tonight Show, you know, it was a 1965 yeah. clip, and he's smoking a butt during his monologue. And halfway through the monologue, he finishes the butt, drops it on the floor, puts it out with his foot, and keeps going. <laughs> It's like you you stopped in the middle of your set to litter. <laughs> it's just a different it's a different time. It was just a it was just a different totally time, different, different time. time. It was just a totally different time. But um, it was like that is one of my favorite and there's if I may there's a, he's not alive anymore but there's a guy who wrote a book called Seriously Funny. Gerald Nachman is his name. Yeah, his sure name. Gerald Nachman. And that book is about those guys. 
the anti nightclub comics, Mort Saul and the whole crew. Did Jonathan that come Winters. before going too far? When was when was serious? Yes, it's before was, going. Oh no! Oh, that's a good question. Oh, that's the uh, Hendra book. Yeah, Tony Hendra wrote a good book about. It wasn't that, specifically about stand up. It was really right, about right. National Lampoon and. It's a lot about Tony of, too. Well, yeah, halfway through the book, if it comes out, here's why <laughs> yeah, I slept with my friend's wife, and here's why it's yeah, not yeah, a big yeah. deal. <laughs> um, but yes, he's... So anyway, I would recommend that book, and it's uh, highly, if you're interested in the history of stand-up. Yeah. And it was just a beautiful... It's my favorite era. It is? Of comedy, yeah. Pre-comedy clubs? Pre-comedy oh, clubs. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, just because it was... Just, it was uh, the Twilight Zone 50s and 60s, and it was just... Oh yeah, okay. you know it was just classy. And people are littering. People, yeah, but it's just you know people in suits and ties, cocktails, and you know it's like you were. It was just a groovy, a groovier time. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, it would have been great uh, to have seen it. Um, and uh, yeah, and 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 uh, and Lenny Bruce came Lenny out Bruce of, from came that out era, that. and yeah. he's actually from. Believe it or not, and this is something. One era where I, area where I really wish I had written more of in the book is there's a strip club circuit in the right. 40s, 50s. This is the and came that's Lenny, came, Lenny came out of the yeah, strip, strip club, club circuit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, of course. He came in. Yeah. yeah. That's where he so, met his wife. So everyone never a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> I met my, here's not the first, never, not the last, yeah, no, by no, the way. Not the last either, Drake. <laughs> yeah, uh, Drake. You know, it's like, I met my wife at a strip club and we lived happily ever <laughs> after. You never hear that. Um, yeah. And, uh, and emceeing for, uh, at a burlesque show. But even, no, no, no. He was doing like a strip club here in Los Angeles, a couple ones, and then got a following of people right. and he would do. There was something he would just do great stuff. There's one thing I think he did it at the at the strip club. He would be able to call someone. You could hear it through the sound system. Mm -hmm. So like people would be there with their like on a date or he would no, do excuse kooky, me. This might be crazy interlude. calls. <laughs> this is the interlude. He would call the babysitter and say that you know Mike and Lucy. This is the police. They died in a car accident, but don't worry. You just have to take care of the kids for another three days. We're going to be over there, like that kind of thing. Oh, so it was like very awful. out of the box kind of. Uh, I, I yeah. So he's part of that strip club world. By the way, here's a and, little and a big part of that world, heroin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, indeed. From the drummer. Yeah. Always you get yeah. it from the drummer. Yeah. But there's um, comedians that also played strip clubs. Kelly Monteith played a bunch of strip clubs. I didn't know that. Gabe know Kaplan that. played a bunch of uh, strip clubs, including the famous one in Dallas that was owned by the guy who shot by Jack, Ru Jack Ruby, the yeah, carousel played, club. He played the carousel. The carousel. There was a comedy club over a strip club that I worked at oh, in I, Washington, D.C. Of course. A yeah. comic cafe. I've done it myself. Todd Glass and I did that room together. Yeah, and my memory of that, and this will is a testament to the time. This was late eighties, I believe eighty nine. It was uh, January of eighty nine, and there was a common area backstage with a staircase, and it was the the dancers' dressing room, and then upstairs was the comedians' dressing room, and. Uh, I was downstairs and someone said, don't use that hairbrush. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. <laughs> um, love it, love it. Love it. Uh, nowadays, but, that wouldn't be a problem. Um, right. But uh, yeah, that was, uh, that, was a tr that was a true story. Well, um, one of my great, I, one of the I, reasons I'm thrilled to do this podcast is because in the same way, and we spoke about it earlier a little bit, that... There was a reaction against the nightclub comedians with Mort Saul wearing the sweater. And then your generation, in particular, what happened at the Big and Tall Bookstore, mm -hmm. which is was in the a book. reaction against, in the early 90s, against what was happening in these comedy clubs. Yeah, it was, you know, that. Can you that, tell me a little about what you guys were thinking? Because I'm just fascinated. Because in a way, yeah. you guys are well, you the know, Mort Sauls of that, <laughs> of that 
I know. It was just a it was just people in suede coats writing on their hand. <laughs> um at that point, you know, you talk about so you get for Lenny Bruce and yeah. Mortsall, and then you get the comedy album. Oh, yeah. And the, well, that's and the a big comedy, part of Mortsall's right. fame as well, by the way. Right. He's, and yeah. Bob Newhart's and Lenny Bruce, and and yeah. that breaks down the language barrier, and that makes comedians Bigger and more so. And at the same time, and we're not talking about it, at the same time, you have all these, you know, Jerry Lewis and, and Alan King and these very traditional Bob Hope, Milton Burl, Jack Benny. They're still huge. 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 Comedy album is so important in the history of all of this for a number of reasons. One, it allows these guys, Shelley Berman and Bob Newhart, Bob Newhart particularly, to reach crazy audiences and reach a level of fame that really made the nightclub guys, Joey Bishop and Alan King upset. And they would not put out albums. There was a real cultural divide. They said, I'm not going to burn my act. Exactly. Yeah. Why should I give for a dollar 98 my act away when I'm getting 18,000 a week in Las Vegas? And it made sense. And they looked at these, Little, I don't know, jazz club comedians. Like, I guess that's the level we would call them, right? Um, as like, oh, they couldn't come close to doing real stand-up comedy like we do here in Vegas or in the Catskills or in right. Miami Beach. Right. So it was a real cultural divide right. that was similar to alt and mainstream comedians. I know it keeps right. jumping to that. That's okay. but I'm just But I'm just saying the record album, oh my God, if you think about it, is the first time someone heard an entire act, an entire right. act, right? In well, no, their environment, well, no language, no language barrier, no nothing. And so it was kind of like the precursor of our comedy central specials or our HBO specials, because you're seeing the entire act. That's the right. entertainment, right? So and then people, you, so you get the feel of it, like oh, this is a little room. Oh, this is a hot room. Oh, this guy's struggling. Oh. A little guy named uh, uh, Bill Maher would transcribe Robert Klein's albums. Like, oh, this is how a joke is told. This is how many laughs. Right. right, yeah. So it, it, would was, lay, it would give you, as a kid, you could hear yeah. something you could never otherwise hear. And also, as a kid, who else has albums? Rock stars. Right. So you weren't playing the supper club. You weren't somebody that your parents would go to see at a supper club. You were somebody you would go to see a rock star. Oh, interesting. only you were being funny. Um, and and uh, now I'm in. I don't know if 60s. I would call Bill Dana a rock star, but go ahead. <laughs> but that but but that's what it was like. Six. I'm talking about like Carlin Pryor. Oh, the 70s. Steve albums. Martin. Yeah, yeah yes, the, the yeah, ones that yeah. evolved. You know, those comedians were on Don Kirshner's rock concert and the Midnight Special, and they were they were in the same breath with rock stars. So for my generation, your generation. They were, you know, like Jerry Lewis was a comedian. George Carlin was a rock star who mm -hmm. did comedy. Yeah. But, you know, and that's much more appealing to a young kid, I think. Um, and that's, you know, that is the interesting segue from, you, you talk about Time Magazine did an article on, I believe it was Time Magazine. It was called Sick Humor. Yes. Mortsall, Mortsall, Shelley Berman, Lenny Bruce, Nichols and May were even in there. They're pretty tame. But it was a it was a no it was just a it was a branding. They're sick. They're sick comedians. Um, because they weren't doing mother in law jokes. Right. And right. and there was a to, yes, the sick Nicks was the name of that article. And there was kind of a like you could tell horrible jokes about driving over a kid or something like that, or a yeah. baby. Like there was that going on in right. society, but they also thought what definitely what Lenny Bruce did was sick. Yeah. There's totally. no question. Yeah. 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 yeah it's really weird. It's just, it's yeah, no one article. had ever, yeah, it is. And nobody had ever done, like, you know, Lenny, Lenny Bruce, Lenny Bruce did a bit uh, for an example, uh, you know, just a, this is a one off the top of my head, the, the famous footage of Jackie Onassis, mm -hmm climbing over the back of a limousine and, and in time magazine, life magazine, it said here, the first lady is crawling over the hood to get help. And then he's like, she's not getting help. She get the fuck out of there. They're shooting. Yeah. And people wanted to crucify. Him. 
course. Um, how dare you say that? He was actually they going did. for a chunk of his brain. Right, 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 um, right. right. And that way one. they did crucify him. Yeah, they did. Oh, they did. No, they, they, they pulled it <laughs> off. Uh, he helped. Um, yes, yeah. <laughs> they had a willing partner in that. Yeah, 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 they had a willing partner in that. Um, but, you know, that was that weird bridge. And then you get into, and and for me to tell my story, you'll have to tell your story. What? Tell me the origin of the 80s comedy boom. How did this, because in late 70s, I'm in late 70s, I'm in junior high school, mm-hmm. and there's George Carlin, Richard Pryor, Steve Martin is bigger than anything. Absolutely. And the original Saturday Night Live mm-hmm. is bigger than anything. And they were rock stars. They were. No question. So, like I'm, fr- I am friends with Lorraine Newman, and that freaks me out. That I'm friends with a member of the original SNL cast because those people to me were like the Rolling Goddamn Stones, and they were so big. And and then in the eighty, you have this wellspring of comedy, and then something in the eighties happens where it gets super monetized. No question. Well, they figured out. Well, I mean, there's so much that happens in the 70s. It's incredible. That's really where it starts. It starts with Johnny Carson moving the show to Los Angeles. Right. Which is and 72. Then, yes. And then with in the next year, he Freddie Prince famously goes on the show, has this great set. Carson gushes over him. They come back from commercial. Carson's still talking to Freddie Prince. They go to commercial. They bump the last guest, Irma Bombach, to talk to Freddie Prince one more time. First 19 years old, 19. So he, so everyone, and then within a year, he has a sitcom and he's a millionaire, Freddie Prince. And he, yeah, obviously. Didn't what could it. go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> right. Not a, yeah, he paid his dues and he was very able to handle, he was able to handle it. So, so anyway, there's a migration of all these comedians that come to Los Angeles and to play like, the comedy store, which opened in 72 and then the improv, which opened in 75. And so it's, they've, there's a club. It's weird. There's a club in long beach, excuse me, in Newport beach called the laugh stop. Did you ever play that club in a way? That's the first comedy club. And they weren't quite doing headliner middle opener. They were just using like three of the best acts from the comedy store. There's one show I talk about, which is, Letterman starts, opens, then Robin is in the middle, and then Leno closes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's 1977. So so eventually, and they figure out that like, oh, you can do a three-person show and people will come see this comedy. Just comedy, not I had, comedy I had, and music. But no idea about that Letterman, Leno, Robin show. That's yeah, crazy. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so... And then the next week they were at Foo Bars. <laughs> And then next week, they're back at the uh, comedy store, not getting paid (laughs) and upset. (laughs) Yeah, and annoyed. Yeah. Um, So so it's just great. So they figure out, they start doing these little comedy clubs, and it starts in San Francisco, where the punchline starts. And then it starts in Boston and in these cities. And suddenly, any place that has a liquor license, this is the new disco. Right. And we used to or, joke because yeah. that, now, now we're at the point where you and I are actually there. Right, right. So this And is the we new- used to joke about that. You go in the back room and there's a disco ball and a mechanical bull. And then the stand up mic is the right. third one. And guess you know, what comes after this? When a lot of these clubs close is a karaoke machine. Right. It's all the same. It doesn't matter to these bar owners what's no. going on there, right? Asses in seats. Yeah, yeah. So they figure out a way and it's undercut. It's under uh, it's supported by like television and then evening at the improv happens. So there's a whole like ecosystem that happens. So that's all going on. So this spreads, as I say in my book, like a venereal disease across the United States. Right. And, and, and Jerry Seinfeld had the best joke. What do you say? Let me say to, I'm going to butcher it. But it'll be, you know, the way it worked in the, you know, in the 70s, you'd be in line at the airport. You know, what do you do? Like, you're, I'm a comedian. Oh, that's very interesting. 
<laughs> and in the 80s, it'd be like, what do you do? Like, I'm a comedian. Oh, yeah, my uncle is a comedian. My cousin's a comedian. Yeah. And in the 90s, like, hey, you're, what do you do? I'm a comedian. Yeah, I'm a comedian. <laughs> 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 yes. Yeah. So it was, and p- people loved it. People, it was a great date night. It was it huge. Was cheap. I, it was cheap. I um, lived in Boston. I started doing stand up comedy, you know, at, Started doing it in 1982, but I by wow. 1985 I was working. Can as I a comedian. ask you a question? Who did, did you go to a comedy club and who? Yeah, did I you went to see? the uh, the first time I went. First time I was in a comedy club. It was the first open mic I did. I was 17. Oh wow! So you did okay? Interesting. I was 17, and it was uh, Lenny Clark. I mm-hmm. saw all the Boston guys: DJ Hazard, uh, Barry Katz. Um, Brian Kiley, who I'm still, and, and Bill yeah. Broaddus, two of my very good friends still. Right, right, right. Were there right. the first night I did it. That was um, Barry Katz's act. <laughs> he's a good manager. <laughs> <laughs> got it, got it. No, it was, I mean, it was 82. I mean, every, okay. I could do his jokes for you. Um, but uh, he. So you're uh, there kind of at the start of the boom. And there's Yeah, two- no, I was. But, 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 but the same, like by 1985, I was living in Boston in, in, a, in, a, in a walk-in closet in someone's apartment, basically, and I was doing open mics, but I was working constantly. And by 1986, because I had a car and I didn't drink and I didn't do cocaine, right? I worked all the goddamn time because— Now, can I was, just break this down a little bit? When you say you have a car, was that just to do one-nighters or was that to yes. do a whole week? Well, that was no, just to do one nighters because in Boston they didn't do a whole week. You'd like Where, one night. Give me an here. example of a one nighter. Just spell the it naughty, out. For, the Naughty Pine, which is a that? bar down a bar down in Quincy. Okay, so and you had to you, drive down there. Yeah, I had to get the other comedians to drive down to Quincy, and they had comedy night, N I T E. <laughs> right. And there's a microphone in the corner. They shut it off, and he did stand. The next night you'd be in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, two and a half hour drive at the Shaker Mill Tavern. And then the next night you'd be up in Amherst, New Hampshire, at the Amherst Country Club. And then, it. and you're driving. And here's the thing: every all the big comedians were gacked out of their mind because they were all getting paid in cash. And it was the mid '80s and nightclubs, and cocaine was ubiquitous. I didn't do anything, so I worked a lot because, like, great, he'll drive. Did no we don't question have to, that and having we, a car in the yeah. '80s was a ticket for a lot of yeah. comedians yeah. to get. Like, and we don't have to, and we don't have to give him any blow because he doesn't want it. He doesn't want it, and he's our designated driver. Yeah, so it was. Yeah. So I worked all every night, and I made a bucket of money. You made it all cash, right? All cash, all cash. And Would, well, okay, another question. Again, I'm a historian. And, and, and I'd come home, like I'd be at the, I'd go to the Comedy Connection and do like three shows on a Saturday night. Right. And, That's just a regular and, comedy club, right? Regular, That's, yeah, Comedy Connection, three shows on a Saturday night. And I get right. like two, three, four hundred dollars. Wow. And I had to put it in my sock. I put like forty dollars in my pocket and put the rest in my sock. And then I take the Boston tea. Because is a dangerous Because if I got mugged saying? on the way home, yeah, yeah if yeah. I got mugged on the way home, I could have some money left over. Love it. I love it. So I just, I just, I'm curious when you went to do these gigs in Quincy and you went up to Massachusetts and stuff, did, I mean, went up to and Amherst, did you, was there a like, oh, this guy gets 50, this guy gets 80, this yeah, guy Yeah, the gets breakdown. Home. How did it the work? The breakdown. And yeah, the first guy got, you know, you know, usually gets like 50 or 75 and then the other right. guy would get like 125 or something. And then the headliner would get two, three hundred dollars. OK, here's an interesting thing. And then the, the cut, very- and then the cut was always the secret part that the MC didn't know about. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> the cut for the booker was always bigger than everybody else. Yeah, of getting. course. Of course. Yeah. Uh, here's the interesting thing is like at the very beginning, there were just three people comedy shows. Bo- there was no Bo- everyone got paid the same. Yeah, but, yeah, but, it, was, but it was not got- emceeing; it was tag team. Yeah. Mostly. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So those are so. There's a bunch of one nighters all over the country, all over all, the country, all over the country. And then, did you ever do something called the Tribble Run? Do you know what that is? No, but I know what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that was a bunch of one nighters or and weekend gigs in right. the yeah upper part of the United States, right? No, I moved to San Francisco in 87 and right. L.A. in 89. Well, my I, favorite thing, I'm not going to ask you to repeat it, but when I interviewed you for, I did an episode on my podcast, also called The History of Stand-Up, where you spoke about the which difference. people can still listen to. <laughs> the crowds in 
Boston and the crowds in San Francisco. <laughs> well, I don't even remember what I said. It was something like, like you felt like you were so r- couldn't believe how easy it was to do stand up in San Francisco yeah. compared to the oh, battlefield yeah. you had to go Boston through. Boston was a bad, yeah. Kenny Rogers had the greatest joke about doing stand up in Boston. It's like you're trying to do stand up and people in the front row are welding. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right. And yeah. that wasn't the case in San Francisco. No, in San Francisco, it's like everybody's in berets. Everybody has a comedy fanzine. They come, San Francisco, when I went there, I had two stand up comedy newspapers in, right. in, in Boston. Like, you know, it's like, thank you very much. Don't tell me what to do. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> you know, it, was, it was a rough town. And yeah, San Francisco was like get, go, getting into a hot tub. Um, <laughs> but just to get, I, I don't want to keep it too much longer, but just to tell the story. So then I moved down to LA in 89 and uh, 89, 89, 90, 91, where, and I'm in a weird position because I had my feet in two groups uh, because I was very good friends with Kevin Rooney, who was a very established mainstream comedian and all of his friends, Jay Leno, Bill Maher, Jerry Seinfeld, Larry Miller, um, all those guys, they know me as Rooney's friend and I've middled for many of them on the road at the improvs. And so they kind of think that I'm in that club, but socially I'm friends with Jeanine Garofalo and, and, and Kathy Griffin and, and people that are my age and share my likes. And we would go to the improv and you couldn't do new stuff. Cause it was, I was like, Janine w- went there one night and, and tried some new stuff. And her agent, was like, uh, Jim McCauley was there and he said, you bombed. And she was like, well, I, he was booked the tonight show. And she was like, well, I didn't know Jim McCauley was there. I was just trying out new stuff. So, so we wanted a place where we could try out new stuff and not have to worry about being, about ruining our chances of ever getting on the tonight show. So there was a bookstore on Beverly Boulevard called big and tall books that somebody knew somebody at, and it had a little, at, uh, had a little, loft area upstairs yeah, yeah upstairs yeah yeah and so we said we'll do a show there on wednesday night we just mimeographed a little thing and put it up because it was a small room and we put people in there and and then th- but then we said okay but here's the deal not only not only is it a place to do material to do new material you have to do new material you can't do your shit you've got to you've got to do all new stuff so you would like anybody you would put it off and you'd write it that day because you put it off. And because you'd written it that day, you had memorized it yet. So you would go on stage with your notebook because you had just written it that day. And that became the origin of going on stage with your notebook. It had nothing to do with later. It became like, I'm, I haven't, it's like, I would say there's nothing wrong with memorizing your act. (laughs) You're not a sellout if you've memorized your act. So you don't need to have your notebook with you, but if you've never done it before, yeah, you bring it on. But that became a trope of what? That became a trope. That became a a big trope, a big trope. Yeah. But it wasn't the intention at the time. Um, Yeah. And then, and from that, it became known as alternative comedy. And there were other rooms that were doing similar things in LA and New York at the same time. And it just became a reaction to, by that time, the, um, the ubiquitous, the ubiquity of, of comedy clubs and standard. It's uh, it was Jerry Seinfeld. It really was his organic persona and still is to this day, but it became a trope at the time of comedians that talk like this and everything is who they would. They did sketches about it on Saturday night. Right, right, right. right. Who you know, with Tom Hanks. Yeah. Yeah. Who are these people? And guys with their suit jackets pushed up over their elbows and big shoulder pads and. Uh, and that who was became, the marketing genius that came up with this and then right. they did the act out? Yeah. yeah, and it was just a trope, and we were just like, no, we don't want to. We, you know, Can we I wanted ask to be, you another question. We, about just, this? we wanted to be rock stars too, right? But we wanted to be REM and Elvis Costello and the Pixies. We wanted to be the people that we were listening to, awesome. which were alternative awesome. rock stars. Awesome. How did the audience find you? This is what I don't understand. Like, because I feel like the audience was half this alternative world's game. Like, these people were well, just Well, they, because like, they, comedy clubs... I went to see Elvis Costello at the Universal Amphitheater in 1989 on the Spike Tour. And I sat there... I, 
I think I was with Janine. And I remember looking around at the audience saying, where, where are these people? Because comedy clubs had driven them out by then because they were so commercialized. Comedy clubs were a tour bus coming in from Magic Mountain. You've been there all day and now you're going to go to the improv and then we're going to send you home. You know, it was like our audience wasn't going to comedy clubs anymore. They had been McDonaldized. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was our friends and then word of mouth, but it, it worked quick because there was a group of people our age in LA at the time that wanted to hear stuff that they could relate to and they weren't getting it in comedy clubs. And it very quickly became the thing. And then everybody came and I, owe my career to that oh, wow. because cool people, you know, George Meyer came to see me at Luna Park and became doing a fan the of mine. Doing the Uncabaret? Doing the Uncabaret? Uh, doing Uncabaret and became a fan of mine. And then later suggested me to work on The Simpsons. So had it not been for me at Luna Park and George Meyer seeing me, I wouldn't have gotten hired in The Simpsons and I wouldn't have the career that I have. So I really do owe my career to, to those shows. And a lot of mainstream comedians took great offense to in what we were doing. In the same way, Alan King took offense to people putting out records. Yeah. They, they, uh, I, I know that there was a big article about us in the L.A. Times and Andy Kindler uh, said we're the anti Lenos. Yeah. Which Jay didn't appreciate, but it was never to me. It wasn't, it, it, it wasn't a knock on Jay and I'm older now and I have different perspective, but it was just, like, we're just doing something different in the way that, you know, REM is not Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Led Zeppelin. Right. right They're right. both great. You know, it's right, like, I'm right. not a Led Zeppelin fan, but I understand they're great. You know, yeah, it's yeah, like, yeah. I, I don't begrudge people who love them. Uh, it's just a different thing. It's a different sensibility and it's a right, different, right. Uh, it's, it's a different uh, social group. And it was part of the niching of entertainment. Like this is, you know, this is for Weezer fans. This is you're for that. Um, but then like anything else, it became a trope, you know, and then it became a style and a became you know, Madison Avenue. And it also got, it got sucked into the mainstream. Yeah, completely. Right. And then it had a TV show. But it is interesting to see it still. Now, did you ever do like Luna Lounge in New sure. York City? Eating. Uh, I didn't do a lot of New York. I didn't do a lot of show. I might have done the Luna Lounge, but I was really okay. here. I was. You're more here. Largo. But I was one of the few people, yes, but I was one of the few people at the very beginning of it. That had feet in both. That had feet in both worlds. But yeah. because I was, and I, I really, I, I talk about him a lot. Um, he's, he was so important to me as a, as a person and a friend and as a, as a comedic, uh, guide, uh, because of Kevin Rooney, mm -hmm. um, who really did educate me and, uh, explain to me that wh whatever you were doing, whether you were at Luna Park or whether you were at the Dallas Improv yes. on a Saturday night, it's a show. It's a show. It doesn't matter if it's 12 of your friends in an attic. It's a show. You have a microphone and you're in a light. People are expecting something from you. And I had that discipline and that gift really it was gift to have that awareness even then mm -hmm. because that allowed me to not only take what i learned at the improv and bring it to largo right but i took what i learned at largo and That's brought awesome. it to the improv Incredible. and and Incredible. that that was that helped I, me a lot i have another question for you because in my book i'm talking about my book I talk about something called confessional comedy, right? Which is where people really look inside. <laughs> yeah, for I did a maybe lot the darkest. I did a lot. Of, I did a lot of that, <laughs> right? And I point to the start of that as to a guy who's not really a comedian but was very funny, named Oscar Levant. Sure, yeah, talent as, for talent for genius. Yeah, yeah. So he would talk about 
electric shock therapy, yeah. his depression, all of this yeah. uh, very raw. Yeah. And so where did it come from for you that you were like, oh, I'm going to look into the darkest, most humiliating parts of me. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's okay. No, um, it's and fine. bring it on stage because I do feel like you were one who really popularized it. Well, at that time yeah. in 91, I had a lot of uh, emotional issues. Uh, I, uh, you know, I became uh, diagnosed a couple years later with a, with an anxiety disorder uh, and t- uh, took medication for it and uh, still do. Um, but at the, you know, I was, I had at the time, you know, it had, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It had, it, I had every physical stress related malady you could have. I had irritable bowel syndrome. Uh-huh. I had insomnia. I grind, ground my teeth. I mean, my, my body was ki- trying to kill me and I was, a, I was a wreck. I mean, I was, I was a wreck. Uh, and a lot of it is just genetic. You know, uh, other members of my family have this. They, I go to the pharmacy, go to, they go to the liquor store. It's the same. You're doing the same thing. Um, and because I was doing this comedy where you would, well, you have to write it today. So do it. You know, that's what I was talking about. I was talking about being fucking miserable. And, and I look back on it now and I see clips of it and I turn, it's, I I can't see how anybody could look at it. (laughs) I can't see how anybody would want to hear, see, or be around it. Um, because it was too painful. It was, it was too painful. Too yeah, it's too much. Yeah, too both. I think you could say both. Okay. Uh, okay. Still entertaining. Right. Still entertaining. Still doing the Kevin Rooney show. Still, yeah, but but yeah, pr- pretty dark. Um, but at that point, I was so mad. It was such a mess. Uh, and by the way, never drank, never did drugs. All my brain. Right. Um, all my brain. Was there anyone um, that you saw that was doing that and you're like, oh, maybe I can talk about this and this might help me a little bit? Was there anyone? On stage as a yes. comedian? Yeah. No, Richard Pryor live in concert where he's yes. talking about having a heart attack. I was like, mm-hmm. well, he can do that. That gave me the theatrical awareness of turning it into something theatrical. But it was more, the you know, like to me it was like, could I do, could I do and stand up what, like Tom Waits does with a song. Like, can I, can I tell like a really weird Baroque story about myself? And, uh, but I was literally, it was the only thing I, well, I, I could s- talk about it. Cause it was the only thing on, on my mind at the time. Well, you will admit that that confessional comedy is very much in the zeitgeist today. Sure. That is yeah. a big yeah. part of it. Almost. And like- it's, it's, it's fine, almost but, like a trope now. Like, but it oh, was I'm, funny. You have yeah. to. It still has to be funny. Oh, I <laughs> still, you, I it still you, has I to. Hear you're talking to. Yeah, yeah. It, it it still has to be funny. It's still right. a stand up show. You know, it. it uh, if you don't want to do, and I did a one man show that wasn't all funny called Insomnia. That was a lot of that stuff done in a traditional theatrical structure with a director and a thing. Mm -hmm. And I didn't call it stand-up comedy because it wasn't stand-up comedy. It was, it was a one man show. Uh, But if you're going to do it at stand-up, I mean, I love stand-up because it is a, it's a gutter art. Um, What do you mean? It's a, it's a, for the groundlings, no pun intended. It's a, you know, it's just a mic and a stand and a spotlight. You don't, that's all you need. And you can do it anywhere and you do it for anybody. And I, and I love to take just that, that stripped down black box and create a theatrical experience with just your technique without any music cues or spotlight or anything. You just do it with what you have there. I mean, I always found that very appealing. Uh, um, uh, but it is still, but for it to be done in a comedy club, you still have to end it with a joke. You still have to end it with a laugh. Other podcasts reach for the sky. Dana Goldbaum. We barely try. This has been the Dana Gould Hour, brought to you by the internet. 
Music by Andy Paley, with Jake Posner behind the board. Produced by Jeff Fox. Graphic design and web production by Spencer Hunt and Segan Friend. Sound editing and post-production by Jalinda Palmer and Joe Napolitano. Hey, if you like the show, why don't you drop us a line at show at danagool.com. Tom Kenny speaking. I'm a DJ, I'm a DJ, I'm a person, I'm a person, I'm a singer, I'm a singer, I love to sing, and DJ, boom, peace out, peace out, you want?